Welcome back. It's the What We're Talking About podcast, podcasting exclusively from livingonsports.com. I am Michael Spencer, joined as always on this cold Tuesday night by Cheston McGuire. Talked a little bit about the Super Bowl in the first block. Now we're going to move over to the association, the NBA getting ready for its All-Star weekend. What do you make of the NBA's All-Star game? We talked a little bit about the Pro Bowl right. last show. And how we don't particularly like the Pro Bowl. How no one particularly likes the Pro Bowl. What do you think of the NBA All-Star Game? I really like it. Um, the game itself, I guess I should... Let me rephrase it. I like All-Star Weekend. The game itself doesn't really mean much to me. It's fun to watch for the first half. Or, you know, a little bit. Because it's some good offensive showings. But after a while, it's kind of boring. But I really like the time dunk contest. Three-point contest. Um, I didn't really watch Horse last year. But Rondo's in it this year, so I might. Uh, the skills come... I just think there's a lot to do with it. And it's fun. And I think the players enjoy it, too, more so than the players enjoy the Super Bowl. Oh, definitely. Uh, the Pro Bowl, rather. Yeah, and I, I think that's true. It's, uh, I mean, with more limited spots, it's harder to get on, I'd say. I mean, you look you look in Kobe, you know, Kobe's been battling a lot of injuries, and we'll touch on that here in just a little bit. But he came out and said, no, I'm going to do everything I can to try and play in the All-Star game. That's an honor, and it means a lot to me that the fans voted me there. You look at a guy... Coaching-wise, too, Mike Woodson from Atlanta, he said, man, I would love to coach in the All-Star game because that is such a huge honor to be there. Yeah, I think it means a lot to these guys, and I like watching I think it's fun. I think they have a good time out there together. Uh, Shaq's not in it this year, but every year you see Shaq do something funny or crazy, and I, I think it's a good show, and it's going to be amazing that they're going to have 90,000 people there probably. That is going to be crazy, and I think it's in a great place for the All-Star game to be because it is a spectacle. No, I, I agree. I think that I'm, I'm as, as much as I don't like Jerry Jones or Dallas Stadium, I think that it's it's a good thing because it's a brand new arena that can hold this many people, and it's going to be Dallas is going to be crazy this weekend. Now we talked a little bit earlier about Kobe and how he's he's being held out by the Lakers against his will, really. But I think it's the right decision because if you look, the Lakers have won their last two games. They won at Portland, which they hadn't done in like several years. Yeah, and then last night they beat the Spurs. I mean, I think Phil Jackson is making the right move because uh, while you always want your best players on the court, right now it's just before All Star break. They've they've got a good record. They're not in any danger of slipping really any spots. And like you said, they are performing without him, and they need to be able to know that they can down the line if he's out. So why not rest him? Now, what about the theory that Jackson is proving a point to Kobe, saying, "Hey, listen, I'm your coach. You'll do what I tell you to do." Uh, maybe that's part of it too, because even when Kobe broke the uh, point record for uh, broke Jerry West's record, Phil said, "Well, I'm glad he got it, but maybe we can go out and play team ball now." He was getting upset with old Kobe showing up, and this might be a dual thing of keeping him healthy and showing, "I'm still your boss. You got to do what I say. Play team ball." That's exactly right. I mean, the Lakers lost that game, you know, and Kobe and Kobe had 44, but it was, it was as you put it, the old Kobe. Um, and I think, you know, I think the Lakers, if they're going to succeed, they need to get the rejuvenated Kobe, if you will, because that's how they've won in previous years. Right. And if they're going to win the championship this year, they need Kobe to play like a team player. They need healthy Gasol. You just can't have a disruption or a ball hog because you, you will lose if you do that. What do you think about the hottest team in the NBA right now being the Orlando Magic? Because they are playing unbelievably well. Vince Carter, too, which is shocking me. How about Vince Carter? I was from North Carolina. I'm still against that trade to a degree, but uh, he's doing well. The Magic are doing well. I was very surprised they came from behind and beat the, the Celtics like they did. And then, and then, well, we'll get to, to Doc Rivers' comments in a minute. Look at the Magic on paper. They're, on paper, a really freaking good team. You got Dwight, Jameer Nelson, Vince Carter, Rashard Lewis. Those are four all-stars right there. J.J. Redick. Yeah, he's got to <laughs> he's got to throw in the Duke comment when we're one day away from Carolina Duke. Uh, yes, JJ Redick, um, th- they're a legit team on paper. They've got to transmit that onto the floor, though. Yeah, I think that they have some issues, and they haven't really gotten. I mean, last year they were successful because they were using a system that usually you don't see work, which was shoot the three and Dwight Howard gathers boards and puts it back. And they said, well, if you get cold, you're going to lose, you're going to lose. And eventually you know, they did, but they, I think they just played a much better team. <laughs> they lost in the finals. I right. Mean. I mean, they made it there, but then they got they got pretty well handled by the Lakers. Um, so I think they're just transitioning to a new style offense with Vince Carter because he's not Hito Turkoglu on popping threes like that. And I think by come playoff time, they could win it this year, which I would not have thought coming into the season. 
speaking of, I hope that hiccup didn't get on air. Um, speaking of rejuvenating and maybe revamping your team and not necessarily gelling very well, that's a smooth transition to college basketball where Texas slumping majorly right now. Yeah. Um, when they were number one, people were saying this is the most complete, best team, hottest team. Any kind of a superlative you could give to them, they were getting it. You know, Damian James, Avery, Avery uh, Bra- Bradley. Bradley, yeah. Um, everyone was thinking, Dexter Pittman, they are like, this is a great team all around. They have size, they have speed, skill, shooting, and all of a sudden, they just can't seem to win a game in Big 12 play. It's, I mean, it's bad. They lost last night at home to Kansas. They got blown out. The score was not resemblance of the game at Oklahoma. Um, I mean, it's it's not good for Texas right now. You look at Texas, Carolina, and UConn. Carolina and UConn are in danger of not making the tournament, and Texas is slipping very, very fast. Yeah, I'm I'm still kind of surprised they're a top 15 team with all those I don't losses. think they will be after this weekend. I would think not. I mean, it's kind of like in football with Oklahoma, how with three losses they were still in top twenty five. And, and if they keep and if they keep sputtering, you may see them have to have a big Big Twelve tournament in order to get in. They may be looking at being on the bubble after being a number one team in the country. Yeah, and that would be very surprising. From a uh, Rick Barnes team is generally a very good coach, and they have youth and they have experience. They have everything that you really want out of a team. So I still think that they come tournament time, I think they can turn it around and make a run. But right now, I think they're really in danger of, so, of kind of blowing up almost. So what's wrong? You've got all these coaches. You've got all these players. It's not like they don't have players at Texas. It's not like they don't have players at UConn. It's not like they don't have players at Carolina. It's not like they don't have great coaches. Granted, obviously, UConn's coaching situation is not the greatest. But they've been but, doing fine without Calhoun, actually. But, but what's going on? Why? I mean, why is there such a struggle? It's not like they don't have the McDonald's All-Americans. But even the coaches don't know what's going on. I think with uh, UNC and UConn, it's been that their their freshman and sophomore class has not been what you would hope or think. They both lost a lot of players to the draft the past couple of years. UConn, I mean UNC especially after uh, winning the championship, lost a lot of play, you know, graduation draft, etc. And, and that's going to take a toll on you. You can bring in as many uh, McDonald's All Americans or five star recruits you want. If that's just not going to be the same as having a Tyler Hansborough there, and without him there, you're not going to be able to be as good. And it's, uh, you know, I tweeted, and I told you I'd bring up Twitter in this <laughs> segment too. I tweeted earlier today. I said, "Hey, dear ACC, take your beatings while you can. We'll be back soon. Love Carolina." And I think, I think that's true. And I think, you know, Texas will recover this year. I don't think Carolina will recover this year. No, I think you, UNC will probably miss the tournament, but they'll they'll be back next year because they're still going to. I mean, Ed Davis will probably be gone, but they got those uh, the twin brothers, or, right? The Ware brothers. Yeah, and and they are going to bring in more guys. And they'll have a, they'll have another year of experience of. I think a lot of it's actually stemming from their point guard play. I mean, they've well, had Ty Lawson play, and, and Raymond Felton in the past. Too many turnovers. And what it comes down to, and you see it in Texas and a little bit in UConn, especially in Carolina, their defense is just so bad. Right. Their defense is awful. Um, and that that is huge. You're really, you know, there's always been that old adage, the defense wins championships. Carolina's defense right now is killing them, and Texas's defense recently has been killing them too because they're giving up huge amount of points to Oklahoma. Yeah, I could not believe they lost to Oklahoma like that. And, and they were they were getting killed. They were getting crushed. Yeah. Um, so what do you call it on tomorrow night for Duke UNC? I really don't want to talk about that on air. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'll be sitting there like I always do in my room with my door closed. Uh, my phone will be off. I've already alerted everyone that's important not to talk to me and that I will talk to them come 7 o'clock. The game starts at 8. Come 7 o'clock, I completely shut off. Get locked in my room in my best Carolina outfit and hope for the best for tomorrow night because I don't think it's going to be pretty. I think I, I think Duke is really going to hand it to him. All right. The thing is, though, the thing is, the only thing going for Carolina is that tomorrow's game is the only thing going for Carolina. Right. I mean, a win like that can really turn around their season. Uh, do you think they might the NCAA tournament this year? I really don't. All right, win tomorrow? Do you think that changes? Win tomorrow, I really don't think it changes. I think they honestly have to win out and have to do well in the ACC tournament in order to make the NCAA tournament. All right. Interesting call. And that's tough. tough I mean, that must be hard for you to say. For me to say. Uh, Valentine's Day or the Daytona 500 National Signing Day recap and uh, 13-year-old signing? What is up with that? We'll talk about that next. It's what we're talking about.